Anyway, we are here now. Hello and welcome to my panel that I am presenting on Final Fantasy XIV's music and how it inspired me to become a musician. Oh wait, I should switch screens all though. Yeah, there you go. Hello and welcome. Uh, wait, 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 wait. No spoilers, there you go. Anyway, sorry about that. Of course, in this panel, there will be spoilers. I will not be shying away from those. So, you know, just be mindful of that. Now, this is a convention that focuses on Shadowbringers, and, well, celebrating the ending of Shadowbringers, and we're celebrating the start of Endwalker. So, most of this panel will be focused on Shadowbringers content, and I will be talking specifically about the techniques and light motifs used in those. Yeah, music's a tad loud. Yeah, we can turn it down a notch. There we go. That should be good. Alright. So, without further ado, I think we may begin. Uh, just a second here, please. Alright. So, yep. I've been a musician for around two years or so now. I started back in November of 2019. And the reason that I decided to even start in the first place was because of Final Fantasy XIV's music. And analyzing Soken's work has actually did actually teach me a lot about basic composition and basic sound design in general as well. And Basically, what I'm going to be talking about in this panel are both the more technical and both interpretive aspects that are employed in his music, which are both combined together to tell a cohesive story. Because I believe that Silken is primarily a storyteller, well, is a storyteller first when it comes to music. Which is why I think most of these songs affected me as well, you know. Which is why I think they resonated with me as much as, much as they did, so to speak. And I will be talking about how he achieves this through the usage of instrumentation, through the usage of musical techniques, and through the usage of leitmotifs, which we have plenty of those. And yeah, uh, so not only do they dictate how the player feels, but also indirectly tells them the story of what's going on inside that, you know, specific moment. And it is, uh, it is a blend of many different elements to form all of these experience. And one key thing among them is are all these background elements and minor details that are especially very, very, very important in sort of bringing it together in a whole. All right, so without further ado, why don't we talk about what's going on here? What's going on here? The music itself. And the first track, well, we're gonna be starting off with a personal favorite of mine. Uh, may not be what you expect, but we will be starting off with the Titania, What Angel Wakes Me. And this is a very good example of instrumentation and musical technique dictating how the player should feel in that trial. So, why don't we have a bit of a listen and check out exactly how Soken does it. And I will switch over to the track in a second here. Please bear with me and please be patient. We're just going to have a small listen and then I'm going to talk about it.
So I'm just going to stop it right there for now because there are a couple of things that I want to talk about in that little part that we had just over there. So first, very unique among the game tracks. It's like a waltzy 6-8 time signature, which already sets the tone. And okay, again, I don't have much of a musical background, so I can't quite explain it the same way that a professional does. But the best way I can explain it is instead of, you know, go having like a one, two, three, four kind of beat, it has a more waltzy one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three kind of beat, you know? So already, what do we have? We already have a very sort of dancey, a very playful sort of sort of theme. And we already have we already have a few little background elements that emphasize a sort of titanious personality and history. We have the plucky you know little the plucky little background plucks in the in the background that makes titania seem very subtly at a hinge due to her history and a very quick history lesson uh titania uh they were you know basically king of the fey in the world of the first and when you know that entire calamity happened and uh you know the light flooded the world and it all went to crap and the light wardens uh just started messing everything up and killing people and you know so titania eventually succumbed and became a light warden themselves but they didn't become a full one so as you can see they still uh retained their form but um they still sort of had you know their sort of playfulness that was that kind of got pretty much that pretty much got like an twisted in a sort of like malicious kind of playfulness and the best way I can describe those little background plucks is I actually have a small demo that I transcribed here, which I will show you momentarily. So if you will direct your attention to my little transcription here, we have uh, the little plucks that we hear in the background. Now, what I think is very noteworthy about these is this little this this little thing, this little A sharp right here. Because this section of the because this section of the song is in the key of D, right? And this little A sharp does not fit into the key of D. Because if you'll notice, I'm not sure if you can see clearly, but if you'll notice, the little uh the lighter background here symbolizes it's in the key. And the darker background here symbolizes its notes that are not in the key. So, yeah, the A-sharp here isn't in the key, and that, I think, is what really gives it the sort of malicious kind of playfulness uh, feel. Because if we put it in the... Because if we drop it down to an A, so it's in the key, then what we get is... So, you know, it's very nice, very waltzy, very playful. You're having like a little tea party with the King of the Fairies. We put it back down to A, A sharp, and... Still a playful little tea party, but you know, the tea is poisoned and the fairies trying to shank you every chance they get. So, once again. In key. Off key. And that, I think, is really what gives off like that really unhinged sort of vibe that Titania has. Like that very mildly unhinged. Because everything else is in key. But this A sharp gives it a sudden sort of little spike in tension. And then it resolves very nicely back down to D. And then it starts all over again. Just like a dance. And yeah. the And the lyrics just sort of like further emphasize the playfulness, you know, with the fa la 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 la, ring a ling a ling, you know, like that kind of stuff. But like, I think coupled with those, with like those sort of, yeah, like those very sort of malicious A sharps, I think is really what sort of helps layer in that malicious, that like that, like that maliciousness beneath that layer of playfulness. And next. Yeah, and Basically, what it what it what the story here is that it details Titania's loss of sanity over over time, and uh, 
and how their playfulness got twisted into being, you know, a little bit more evil after becoming a light warden. A light warden. Of course, the main melody. Um, the main melody as we as we hear. It's bent to entrance the player, right? Like you hear that little A sharp, you hear that little A sharp, and you're like, something is off, but I don't know what. I don't know what's up. I don't know what's off. Something is off about it. It's that little A sharp. Like it's meant to drive you crazy. Just like how Titania is meant to drive you crazy in this fight, with like all of this stuff that we had that we see going on. It's constantly trying to keep you on your toes. And uh, what else we have? And uh, yeah. Next up, and this little next section of song. Yeah, thanks for the FK check. So a couple more things that we have going on here. So around, I think, this part, yeah. The vocals really start to pick up because as we can see here, we have like, you know, all sorts of mechanics going on. You gotta go like every which way. You gotta watch out for the, watch out for the stack marker. You gotta stand in the puddle so you don't get hit by the giant, like, you know, flame fist. You know, you have all of this stuff going on. While these vocals are really picking up, they're really getting sort of, you know, they have like a little uh, delay effect, sort of making it, you know, making it sound even more loopy, even crazier. And basically, it's just it's just like it's just like meant to it's just like meant to overwhelm you. It's just like meant to like make you think like, oh man, there is so much going on. What the, what do I do? Where do I go? What do I? And yeah, basically that's I think that's what Soken was trying to achieve like with this specific piece. And again. Keeping in th keeping in line with the theme of sort of keeping you on your toes, this entire fight, there are also a lot of key changes in the song itself. Because, uh, like in the beginning here, it's you know it's in the key of D, right? Very steady, very constant. Sort of like no, not much going on here. You're sort of dodging attacks, sounds normal. And then uh, later on. When the song picks up, change to the key of A. Like, oh, oh, something's going on here. Oh, what are they gonna do? And then to the key of B, a little higher. Oh, something else is going on. What the hell is going on? I have no idea where to go. Then the vocals pick up, and it's like, oh god, there's so much, but there's so much going on. I don't know what to do. I don't know where I am. I'm dying. Who's dying? Everyone's dying. And then. Results back to the key of F, sort of like you know, the calm, the calm and the storm. Like you survived all that, good job. We're gonna start playing again. And this is a B flat, I believe. I'm not entirely sure. So you know, results can calm me, sort of like the calm before the storm. And then it starts all over again. Again, in line with the lyrics where it's, again, in line with the lyrics where it's like, you know, tumble down, tumble down again, rise again, play again. Just like the theme of Titanio wanting to like keep you here forever. Just sort of like, you know, playing with you, except like their idea of playing with you is just kind of pretty much killing you over and over. But yeah, all of these constant key changes, they're all overall meant to, like, keep you, like, keep you on your toes. It's in line with, like, there's just, like, things getting added on one after another. You don't know what's going on, but you know something's up. 
And yeah, all of these key changes are very instrumental, I think, in that feeling of, oh god, what the hell is going on? Which I think, personally, Silken does a masterful job at. And again, and one more little detail, actually. Uh, when these vocals really start to pick up at around... This part, exactly this part. It's 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 kind of like just like entangling you. It's like it's sort it's it's like sort of like trying to like overwhelm you with just how much is going on already. Um. Uh, so. Yeah, creator. Basically, repetition repetition induces comfort, which is in line with like the sort of less mechanically intensive uh, part of the fight. Whereas the key changes, they actually help keep up the tension, in line with like you know. The stack markers and the fire and the ads and the branch and the brownly branch parts. And yeah, I think like when the vocals really pick up, like it's meant to entangle you, like like just kind of like these branches here, you know. Like the vocals getting like all delayed and like all overwhelming, I think fits in really well as well with the theme of like her branching attack, which personally, I think is a pretty neat little detail. So. Um, uh, yeah, basically, overall, that's more or less Titan- that's more or less Titania. Meant to entrance the player, meant to make him go crazy, meant to keep him on their toes, and it's meant to, like, very subtly drive them- drive them insane. Because, as we all know, when this fight- when this fight first came out, I personally don't think that many of us cleared it on the very first try. I know I sure didn't. And- our next song that I think every, that I think a lot of people will have been looking forward to is uh to the edge which I think personally is easily the most noteworthy song to talk about in this entire you know in this entire panel why because it's it is an absolutely fantastic example of Silken using using music as a storytelling tool because Titania, that was pretty good. It used instrumentation to make you feel a certain way in a trial. To make the player, you know, experience, you know, something <laughs> in the trial. But to the edge, I think this is this is meant more as a storytelling piece. The player is meant to sort of, you know, take in the lore, take in the, stor the story that he's trying to tell. So, how does he do it? Uh, first... We will have a bit of a listen, as we as we are meant to do. So if you will direct your attention. So, before we continue any further, already a few things to talk about. So, right away, rapid ticking percussion, as we've all picked up, immediately references the fall of the fall of Amarat. So, a brief history lesson. So, the Asians were originally, you know, pretty much, you know, the first, uh, you know, basically the ancients that used to live in the universe before everyone before everyone else did. And they had access to very, very powerful creation magic. 
which they use to, you know, create like, you know, all sorts of all sorts of wonders. They built, you know, magnificent cities. They, you know, elevated very advanced, very advanced societies. They tried their absolute best to, you know, sort of elevate their own people and help them out as much as they could with like all of this uh, very powerful creation magic. And so what happened? Well, uh, the details, I'm on, honestly, the details are a little bit hazy, but one way or another, um, the creation magic sort of went out of control and basically monsters started appearing out of their own subconscious desire, out of their own like subconscious. And it all just started like wreaking havoc around Almorat, this magnificent, this magnificent society that they worked so hard to build. Suddenly, it all started crumbling down. It all started, you know, going down, it all started, you know, going down the toilet. It was, again, the end of days at the time. And basically, they were trying their absolute hardest to prevent what was happening through uh, sacrificing around half the population in order to, in order to summon Zodiac, uh, so to speak. And then, well, you know, as we all know, a member of the Convocation didn't exactly agree with that, so they summoned Hydaelyn, and then, and then the two, basically these two gods of the world at the time, fought each other, and Hydaelyn eventually punched Zodiac so hard that the universe split into 13 different fragments. Which, yeah, that's basically a very brief history lesson on Almorant, a magnificent society that basically brought that basically brought around its own downfall no matter how no matter how hard uh no matter how hard uh the Asians sort of tried to prevent it and yeah the rapid taking percussion what that's meant to represent is it's meant to you know it's sort of meant to like you know represent them counting like you know counting down to the end of days you know it's like it's like very rapid ticking that's you know very um how do I say it very des, very like, very, very like desperate. Very like, oh man, we have to like, we have to like go do something because like, it's ending. The world is, en our world as we know it is ending. And that helps Earth like, especially like, like the chords, um, like the chords being played in the background here. They, yeah, they already. Oh yeah, thanks for the AK check again. There you go. And yeah, basically. All those instruments in the background, they're meant to uh, emphasize a very melancholic mood throughout. Lots of feeling, lots of feelings being evoked. Like, is it a feeling of hope? Is it a feeling of desperation? The line, I think, is drawn very thinly there. It's a very thin, it's a very, very thin line between hope and desperation. That's, I think, that's what I interpret one of the themes of the song to be, so to speak. And yeah, it tells a story of, and oh. Actually, before we get onto this, I should uh, go further into the song. So we can hear the lyrics. So right away, uh, the lyrics, they tell the story of not only uh, Elidibus, who is of Elidibus, who is uh, the handsome man pictured here in the pictured here in the slideshow, but of the Asians, who were the the ancient civilization that we were talking about, but also of Elidibus's own downward spiral, because again, 
Uh, let me... I should actually mention this. Elidibus was part of, like, you know, that council, that convocation that was that was meant to be like, okay, what do we do? How do we get out? How do we get out of this? You know, who's going to save us? Who's going to, like, save us from this end of days? What are we going to do? And Elidibus, who he was, he was basically, like, the... He's described as he's described as like the youth of the council. He's described as you know young man. He's like he's basically he was basically like you know the very like the younger like the little brother of the council, the one that you know like everyone thought had like a bright future. Everyone like you know looked forward to like what he was what he was going to do. And yeah, this song I think is just very tragic because um it details like you know you know his his downward spiral because. It's been so long since that civilization of his collapsed. It's been so long since, you know, he's lost everyone he knows. He's lost everything he knows that he thinks the only way to bring that back is to is to sort of, you know, uh, destroy entire worlds himself. Just just so that he just so that he can, like, give him even the hope of you know, bringing the world that he had back, sort of like rejoining every single world into one massive, massive world, just like how it was before. All in the hopes of like even seeing like, you know, his colleagues, his friends, his family, his civilization all over again. And uh, yeah, especially, um, especially with certain lyrics here, uh, such as... Our surrender, a somber, a somber reverie, like basically, they had to surrender. There was nothing. There was nothing more they could do. And it was, you know, very a very song. It was very somber. It's like a very, you know, somber song of like, well, this is it. There's nothing more we can do. We've tried all we can. Slowly drifting down into twilight. Left is sitting through, left is sifting through faded memories. So again, describing Elidibus as like the sole survivor of that entire calamity. Basically, he's lost his memory. He's been drifting through worlds. And all he has left are faded memories. He doesn't even know why he's fighting for whatever he's fighting for anymore. He's not even sure. All he has is just like that base instinct. That base, you know, desire of, I want to see them again, but how can I see them again if I don't even remember what their faces look like, you know? So, again, this, this lyric, I think this lyric is probably the most important out of all of them, brother, stay this descent to madness. So, this could be, again, I think this song is so full of double. Is this song is so full of double meanings? You could interpret this so many different ways. So, you could interpret this as uh, Emmet Emmet Selk. Uh, so Emmet Selk is another survi another survivor alongside Elidibus, basically who survived you know that entire calamity. And, um, basically, it could be interpreted as sort of Emmett Selig being like, you know, you know, this is, you've already, you've, you know, you've already gone mad. This is, you know, you know, you don't even know what you're, what you're sort of fighting for anymore. Like, what is, you know, the point? All we want is to be remembered. We don't, you know, like, need to do any of this anymore, so to speak, you know? And it could also be inferred to as like sort of Elidibus himself back when he was part of the council uh okay the details i will admit are a little bit hazy so do feel free to correct me if i do get some of the lore wrong but basically when uh some of the original council departed because they obviously did not agree with sacrificing half of the population to in an attempt to uh sort of save their civilization it could be interpreted as, you know, them telling their brothers to, you know, stay this descent of madness. Because, you know, they were going mad. They simply were not knowing what to do anymore. And then the next lyric. Coming 
come and save us, catch us before we fall. So again, full of double meaning because this could be interpreted so many different ways. So like, this could be what Elidibus, this could be what Elidibus himself heard. He could have heard his brothers, you know, calling out to him to, you know, come, you know, save us, to, you know, save us, bring us back, bring our civilization back. Catch us before we, you know, catch us, bring us back before we're forgotten completely, before we fade from history forever, basically. But it could also be interpreted another way. It could be interpreted as, you know, the warrior of dark of like, you know, the convocation calling out to the warrior of darkness as well. And, you know, just the entire world of the first calling out to the warrior of darkness where we are right now. It's calling out to us, calling out to, to for us to, you know, stop a little bit, to, you know, come and save them, to prevent our world, to prevent, you know, this world from becoming just like the Asian's original world, from like, you know, from to prevent that from getting destroyed completely and utterly as well. So again, this could be interpreted one of different ways, and I think this is honestly very masterful writing. So let us uh let us continue. Shadowbringer's main theme. Very common like motif. <laughs> uh there is there there is a lot to a lot to talk about in that like in like those verses that i just showed so uh basically first off like broken angels wingless cast from heaven's gates so basically no they were basically all powerful at the height at the height of their civilization they were, you know, they, I guess they, I guess they might as well have been angels. They might as well, they might as well have been living in heaven because, you know, they could do whatever they want. They could create whatever they want, but, you know, the calamity happened. So they started, you know, becoming broken. They started losing their wings. They eventually started falling and, you know, they just sort of got cast out of the little heaven that they made. Our slumbering demons awake, so... That was their, there's, this references how uh, monsters basically started appearing out of their subconscious, which just started destroying basically everything in their path. So, oh, so we only fly when falling, falling far from grace. So I would guess that this references um the half of the convocation that basically sacrificed half their population to bring zodiac in the hopes that you know he would help them 
because at that point, you know, I guess in a way, think of, I guess like basically when summoning Zodiac, you know, they basically just sort of summon, you know, the devil himself at that point. So, and this was the only way that they knew was forward. So we only fly when falling, falling far from grace. So they saw basically falling from grace, just sort of doing the worst they could do, being the only way forward, so to speak. So hell take a seven can away is just like you now we know we know what we're doing is wrong we don't really care we just want like you know to stop this we just want you know to save our people so our lives a message in a bottle cast to see so again this describes the aftermath basically at this point nobody if anybody at all remembers this great civilization which is why elitibus and you know emmet selk his buddy have gone insane essentially this whole time and basically all their you know like their entire lives or they're all of their discoveries every you know like piece of recorded history that they have ever you know recorded at that point it's just basically cast out to sea it's like a message in a bottle they're just like is anybody going to see this? Is anybody going to read it? Is anybody even, you know, going to sort of, you know, is this going to be seen at all by anybody? Or will it just get, or will it just get lost to the sea? And will it just, you know, be lost forever? So this place untold and unseen. So it's like, sacrifice half their population. Nobody knew that. And yeah, quick to their ends, our candles burn until we're free, so. Yeah, that's basically, <laughs> that's, you know, the candle burning out, like, burning out, like, very quickly. That's just, it's not, it's not getting any better. It's only getting worse and worse and worse. All of the monsters are each other, just, they're just getting worse, they're getting bigger, they're getting badder. They're wrecking even more stuff than before. And summoning Zodiac to you know, sacrifice half the population. That just accelerated everything, basically. And at that point, you know, once everything is done, once everything is destroyed, once everything is gone, you know, in a way, they're just sort of kind of free at that point. Of course, here basically it's like you know they acknowledge that you know you know it's just silent and sinners like they know you know what they did was wrong, but they saw no other option at that point. And that's what they thought they had to do to save you know to, to save their civilization. Basically. So basically this entire chorus is just like, you know, you know, monochrome melodies, our tears are painted in red. It's like, there's, you, you don't see their sorrow initially just because, you know, the first time you see the Asians, they're just, you know, so, they're just, you know, so violent. They're just like trying to, at first, they're just trying, you know, trying to like kill everything in sight. In our world, you know, they're just like, you know, we just want to destroy the world. That's what you think of them at first, but you don't see like the sort of like like like, like the monochrome melodies in that in that you know background. Like you don't see the sorrow of like all those that they've lost, everything that they've lost, everything that you know they can't remember, but like they still have some semblance of memory in there. They just don't know what exactly it is. And basically, it's talking about, like, how, you know, they can't avert fate anymore. It's like, no matter what they do, they're gonna, they're gonna fall. They're all gonna, like, the Asians, no matter what they're gonna do, they're all, they're gonna fall. They're all gonna die. They're 
great and grand civilization is going to come to an end, no matter what they do. And to begin, we must we must we first must see the end. I I guess that uh oh thanks for the timer. I guess that uh this would mean sort of like how you know our current world began. Our current world began because their world ended. So their world was you know the one original world, and when that ended, it split into thirteen separate worlds. You know we're living on one of them. So we began when we saw their end, essentially. <sighs> and yeah, uh, this... Yeah, this song... It just tells, like, such, you know, a tragic story, such such an emotional story, you know? Because it details, like, what became of the Asians after, you know, the Sundering, which is, you know their apocalypse when their world ended and how they're perceived now which is like no they think you know they're basically forgotten at this point their grand exploits and you know the screwed up things they did probably nobody probably nobody except the warrior of darkness our character will ever know and and yeah that second like very guitar heavy half it makes it a lot more desperate like in the beginning, that's sort of like, you know, very melancholic. It's like, you know, very melancholic, very hopeful. You know, it's it's very constant, very sort of, you know, more easygoing. It's got a little, it's got like a constant sort of rhythm to it, very steady, very steady ticking. This is like basically a little bit of hoping that what he will do will bring everything will bring everything back will bring his friends will bring his civilization will bring will just will just fix everything and it's very humble like very melancholic at the same time because it's just like it also has that very faint undertone of what am i even fighting for anymore i actually don't remember And then again, at that very guitar heavy riff, it gets a lot more desperate, a lot more action packed. Like, it's a lot rougher, it's a lot grittier. And I think this is like Elidibus's hope turning into like more of, you know, a sense, a sense of sort of a uh, desperation, you know? Like, you know, I don't know what I'm fighting for anymore. I don't know if this will even work, but this is all I know. I have to do this. I have to, you know. I have to, you know, destroy this world to bring my own back, and th because th like this is all I this is all I have left. This is all that I know to do what to do now. I don't have anything else. I don't have anybody else. So overall, a tale of remembrance. You know, the Asians describing their civilization, describing their fall, describing how they're remembered now, or how you know they're forgotten rather, and a tale of desperation in the face of certain doom, like. We did everything we could. We did unspeakable things to try to bring our civilization back. And yet, it seems that none of that worked. It seems that we absolutely cannot change that. So no matter what we do, we're doomed. That's it for us. That's the end. And yeah, basically like... Like even even like in the fight itself, right? You have a little bit portraying himself as a warrior of light and like you know he's like portraying himself as like the hero of light against you know the evil villain of darkness and in a way that's pretty child in a way that's pretty childlike because again elodibus was the youngest member of the convocation he was basically the younger brother the little brother that everybody said oh he's gonna have a bright future he's gonna do great things and uh so yeah basically he is like a child compared to like all the other Asians. So I would say that this is, you know, very childlike as like, you know, a portrayal of like, you know, classic portrayal of the hero versus the villain. Because a little bit again, he sees himself as the hero of this story. And especially um in this sequence here, where he sort of like where he sort of like, you know, brings shades 
fight along with him. Except, you see? Except in this sense, while, you know... Oh yeah, sorry, in this sequence, uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. I didn't switch screens in time. Uh, so like in this sequence where he brings shades to fight for him, uh, the key difference here is that while we also have a party of eight, this party of eight, let's assume, let's assume this party of eight is our friends, our comrades, the people that we've made connections with along the way, the people that we know, people that we would trust over our lives. That's who we are fighting with against this man. Whereas this man, what he's done is he's basically, you know, brought just sort of, you know, like just lifeless shades that like he's conjured, which again, serves to evoke just how lonely he is at this point. And uh, I have actually seen someone describe it as like, you know, sort of like a child playing with his toys, so to speak, you know? Just to like sort of, you know, reinforce just how, you know, naive he is, how immature he is. Just sort of like how this is like what he thinks is doing is right. Like he sees himself as the hero again in all of this. So again, yeah, very... <laughs> this always gets... This... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this, this always actually gets me very emotional just because it's, you know, a tragic tale of, you know, remembrance. A tragic tale of, you know... An entire civilization being forgotten and an entire you know just you know them calling out to like you know we want to be remembered you know like please please remember us please remember what we did so to speak you know yeah that's that always gets me very emotional that's i and that i think is a masterful example of silken being a primarily a storyteller of his music because just like that just with this one song with like this what maybe three like this one maybe like three five minutes we already got like an entire lore of a civilization we already got what the characters were thinking back then we already got what characters are thinking now we you know there, there is just so much <laughs> there's just so much packed into this and let's see what's yeah see and again as a uh, fane plays pointed out here when you finish the fight, his character model is a child-sized Asian. So, again, he was literally a child. He is basically like a child doing what's right, like using his toys, you know, his murder weapons, to try to, you know, bring his brothers back. That's all he's trying to do, essentially. So, yeah, that's, that's to the edge. That is a lot packed into it already. Yeah. And, oh yeah, and it's got like the, and it's got like a lot of Amara, uh, life, light motifs in it, because actually, I will have to explain this, because this actually tells the tale of, the Amara light motifs and how they progress actually tell the tale of the civilization, and, you know, what it was like, and how it fell. So, let's see if I can bring it up here, okay. Is it this one? Yes. Okay, so this track plays when we first enter the Tempest, like right outside of Amara, right? At this point, we don't even know what Amara is. We just see like a big old city in the distance and we're like, oh, what's that? I want to go there. So, you know, it's, you know, just sort of, you know, very, uh, very chill, very chill vibe. Like, you know, nice little plucky guitars in the background very slow very relaxed it's like you know oh we're exploring the ruins of like what well it could be the ruins of like a lost civilization we don't know what it is we don't know what it was about but you know hey let's go exploring we might find something something cool over there yeah, this is just like you know what what was left behind at this point this is just like telling you what was left behind at that point yeah and you can't see the city until a certain point story-wise. And then, we get into the city itself. Okay, 
So again. Okay, I'm sorry, give me a second. So, yeah, this time we're in the city. We see what it was like up close. It's, you know, very melancholic, very, very soft piano, very soft piano chords, like a, like a very light ticking in the background. And it's like, we sort of see that like, oh, it's, it's like, it just kills us as a wonder, like, we want to know what happened here. You know, who lived, who lived here? Who were these people? What did they do? How did they build something so grand? You know? And it's like, basically this is us like sort of, at this point, it's like us learning the, learning the history of Amurat, so to speak. And it's like, you know, we just go exploring, go look around, take in the view. And that soft ticking in the background just sort of like, it just sort of like, also, it details like, you know, the final countdown of, you know, you know our civilization's done at that point. And yeah, the very soft piano chords just give it a sense of like, you know, very melancholic, very sad sense of like, this is all forgotten. This is all gone now. There's nothing left here. Yeah. Doomsday clock in the background, exactly. And then... And, uh, if you listen closely, that, uh, Amorat, uh, melody... Uh, our singer here, he sings, like, the Amorat melody. So, at this point, we fully know everything that's going on. We know the full story. We know everything. We know the villain's motivation. We know the history. We know what they did. We know why they did what they did. So, at this point, you know, it's like, we have, we're going full force. We're trying to go, like, stop this thing. And at this point, we know that it's like a thin line of, you know, hope versus desperation. Or, like, you no know, being remembered versus being forgotten. And, like, this, like, light motif here. Like, Sokin's usage of light motifs in this scene. And, like, well, not in this scene, but, like, in this entire arc. Like, the way they progress tells a story in and of itself. Like, it tells a story of you, the player, slowly finding out what happened to Amarat. It starts with, like, you know, oh. Cooler winds in the distance. I wonder what that is. And you get in there, and it's like, oh, what happened here? This is like nothing I've ever seen before. Who were these people? What did they do? What happened to them? Then you get to Tooth the Edge, and you're like, okay, I know everything. You know, they just want to be remembered, but we need to stop this. We need to stop our world from, you know, being destroyed just like theirs was destroyed. And yeah, basically, so can. Yeah, very masterful usage of light motifs here. Very, very well done storytelling. And yeah, again on the topic of light motifs, there's just a you know a lot of Shadowbringer, a, a lot of use of the Shadowbringer's main theme in a lot of tracks. You know, tomorrow and tomorrow, Chris the Crystarium night theme, insatiable. Um, I will be going through these fairly quickly just because you know I don't want to drag this on for too too long. I'm sorry, I didn't put it in the video. There we go. Here's the main theme, which will begin shortly. There we go.
So again, basically, what the Shadowbringers main thing talks about is basically just, you know, how like, in this current world that we're in, you know, the flood of, the flood of light happened because, you know, the balance between light and darkness got tipped in the favor of light too much. So light flooded the world and destroyed almost everything, save except for, you know, a few last remnants of civilization that still stand. And basically, like, you know, the lyrics like, uh, Heaven's Banquet, Loving with Lies, and, uh, if I can look for it here. Yeah, here are proud angels bathe in their wages of flood. And so it refers to, like, these very angelic beings that, you know, now dominate this world, that go around killing, that go around killing every inhabitant they can find. So they can just sort of turn it and turn them into more of these things. And oh, AFK check, thank you. And yeah, just to, they just go like massacring people to turn them into more of these like sort of light wardens, like these very angelic beings. So basically, it's talking about how like you know, it's sort of mim it sort of reflects Amarat almost and what they went through because you know at this point, they're also you know, they're also you know. Oh man, it's pretty much the end of days for us too, like in this current time. You know, there's a flood of light, there's all these like monsters, all these angels just like, you know, going around killing people, like what are we gonna do? Just like, you know, proud angels bathing in blood as them killing off all the inhabitant ha inhabitants. And that's like, you know, this is, you know, like calling for like, you know, somebody to like come save them, to like, you know, for somebody to like put a stop to this threat, to like save our world. And in this case, this song would be calling out to us, though, well, the now, pro the newly proclaimed warrior of darkness is calling out for us to, you know, come save them, to stop this calamity, to, you know, prevent sort of what happened to Almorot, in a way. And just, you know, the main theme itself, again, Sogany is a lot of light motifs, like the main theme, you hear it in a lot of other places, such as the night theme in the Crystarium. If I can just like get to work, please. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, so you very clearly hear their main melody here, which is like, you know, you know, we're just like trying to get, we're just trying to get by. We're trying to survive however we can. And it's sort of like, you know, the night's been brought back. We're just, we're just like trying to rebuild. We're trying to survive, see what we can do with what we have, you know? And then again, it's repeated in the boss theme. So immediately, the very distorted vocals, like the very distorted vocals, the booming, the booming drums, the like booming, you know, strings, the strings that are, you know, like very frantic, very frantic, you know, playing very rapidly. It's like, it describes, you know, like the struggle that like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, K I I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, Kea Swan. Exactly. Distorted like the way the light distorts creatures. That's exactly it. And just like, you can like feel the desperation in this theme. It's like, this is like, this is like what plays when it's just like, okay, the warrior of darkness, like he needs to do what he can. We need to do what we can to, you know, save this, to, you know, save this world, to prevent, you know, another calamity. And we're like, you know, fighting with absolutely like everything we have. We're fighting like to the, we're fighting like to the death. Here. Like, we're pu like, we're pulling no punches at this point. Like, even if it kills, like, even if it kills us, like, we will have to get the job done. 
that's the kind of desperation that like this song evokes. And the booming drums, frantic strings, like that's what all of this does. So yeah, I think this is also a very good example of Soken employing both instrumentation and leitmotif in both making the player feel a certain way during the fight and also telling a bit of a story like, you know, of the of our circumstances. Like, like uh, you know, it's like, we need to get this done. Even if it kills you, you need to get this done. You need to save everybody. You basically like have no other choice. Otherwise, everything will be lost and everything, everything and everyone we know will die and will be gone forever basically and at my prime yeah playing with the usual holy imagery too like yeah like those little chains that almost look like rosary beads so yeah oh yeah they're they're they are very big fans of holy imagery with these kinds of games yeah very very good eye glad i caught that okay and next up we have uh Oh, more on light motifs. We also have weapon light motifs. So we have okay. So first, I will begin by playing the theme of the Ultima weapon all the way back in a Realm Reborn. If I can find it here, where did I put it? Oh, here it is. So I'll try to get to the main melody for this, just so we can like you know, sort of have an immediate comparison. Oh, no, actually, no. no. The melody that you just heard, please do keep it in mind because that is that will be a very it, that will be a bit of an important light motif later on. So, what I will try to talk about first, first very importantly, please listen very very closely in what is likely the left ear and if you listen very closely you will hear a heartbeat just like so so something very akin to a heartbeat there please keep that in mind and just sort of like you know the very, you know, like, grand strings, the very, you know, grand orchestral arrangement of this. And, like, the sort of, you know, the... I guess bongos playing in the background? Yeah, sounds about right. Basically, this is the end of the first arc of the Golden Reborn. And this is like, okay, the Warrior of Light, us, we are essentially proving ourselves as a Warrior of Light here. Like, this is basically, you know, our very first big task. This is our very first sort of, you know... Uh stop the end of the world sort of scenario so i think this like this fight is where we truly become like this sort of warrior of light so to speak this is basically you know the warrior of lights like the warrior of lights proving grounds you know this is where they prove themselves and actually let me go back real quick we also have this melody Yep, Subby. Beat the heart of Subby. And actually, just a little bit of background. Um, the for anyone who might not be familiar, the Ultima weapon. This uh, this uh, big old man you see here. Uh, basically, this old Asian here. He's uh, he's a little bit nutty. Don't mind him. Uh, Brea. Uh. 
he basically like someone he basically like you know got this thing working tricked Gaius into activating it because this thing can unleash a very powerful spell called Ultima that essentially has very uh, world destroying uh world destroying properties so if you got that off well now was basically the end of the War of Light's journey before it even started so to speak and the heartbeat refers to like the heart of Sabik which is I guess like I think like a very ancient you know elegant artifact that you know sort of like powers this thing and you know enables it to like actually use Ultima so yeah that's you know just a very quick primer because I'm sure it's been a very long time for many of us. So, going back to the light motifs, yeah, the Warrior of Light proves themselves as the Warrior of Light, acts as the climax to the initial story arc in A Realm Reborn, and of course, these background elements and melodies carry over much, much later into the Ruby Weapon, all the way in Shadowbringers. Now, the Ruby Weapon, eh, I'll just describe it as like, it's basically Ultima, but very aggressive. Think like Ultima, but you're in a mecha anime, essentially. It's a reverse-engineered Ultima weapon that shares the same musical characteristics and melodies. So like, to sort of like establish the fact that it's like a reverse-engineered Ultima weapon, it, yeah, it like just sort of uses the same elements as Ultima's theme, which I will demonstrate shortly. Wait. Oh, I apologize. This is, this is the wrong one. So, right away, we already hear this part, um, if I can find it again. So already, basically the same melody transferred over. In a in a much more aggressive manner because like you know, I mean look at it. It's a, it's essentially like a mecha at this point. You're in like I don't know. You're like fighting a Power Rangers villain. You're in like a mecha anime. I'm not sure. Maybe someone has a better analogy for that. Because yeah, Soken is a very big fan of rock as well. So I guess it makes sense that this Ultima arrangement would be like a very intense rock arrangement. Oh, AFK Wheel, thank you. So essentially what this is, this is just like a part of like a little side story of like, you know, the Seventh Legion, or you know, what's left of them after, uh, after, you know, that, uh, that whole war happened. <laughs> uh, so this, this is the Seventh Legion trying to bring back, you know, the weapons just to, you know, sort of, you know, have another, have another go at Ultima, maybe see if it, you know, works out this time. And since they reverse engineered it. You can already hear a couple of things, so... So like, uh, the little uh, string melody that you hear here... ...is also repeated here in the chorus. But it's just very, very silly there in the background.
So yeah, just as like a, you know, a very quick demo just to demonstrate that. So just like this little section here. Uh, excuse me. That's present in both of these themes, just to, like, you know, further signify that, you know, whoops, it's all Ultima. It's just basically a reverse engineered Ultima, except this time they made it into, like, a more messed up Gundam, I guess, in a way. So, yeah, that's basically the, so yeah, basically, the leitmotif here, it establishes the links. Yep, <laughs> whoops, all Ultima. So yeah, so can basically use both of these melodies just to, you know, sort of this just to, you know, emphasize the fact that it's a reverse engineered Ultima weapon and just and just to be like, hey, wait a minute, we're not done with Ultima yet. It's still a thing. God damn it. Okay, next up. Okay. So sorry, I tried I tried very hard to be concise with like all of that. So I apologize if I missed some things. So what did it all teach me? Or why the hell am I so interested? Why are we so interested? Why, you know, why does it make us feel the way it does? What did it teach me? So, a little bit of background, please. Do keep in mind that I have no musical education whatsoever, actually. I have not had a single formal class in music. I think the last time I had a music class, I think, was maybe in fifth grade. That was it. Didn't even know what a chord, didn't even know what a chord was, didn't even know how to make one, didn't even know what, what a scale was. Everything I know is essentially 100% self-taught. So basically just like after like hearing all of this, hearing like all these, you know, taking all, all these stories, taking all these techniques, I'm just, I was just like, all right, I want to learn how to do that, you know? So like at that point I started, you know, studying music theory, studying, you know, music techniques, listening in very, very closely, you know? just like trying to pick apart every little background detail that I could and yeah the techniques that I've been that I talked about here that Soken has used both in both you know the technical and interpretative aspects the way he used instrumentation and leitmotifs and other you know metaphors and themes to tell a story is what inspired sort of you know my massive inspiration in studying what makes songs and video games tick and because like you know I don't know, it just sort of resonated with me, like, wow, I want to do the same thing. I want to make people feel that way too, you know? And that's when I started thinking to myself, like, how can I, have, like, no, how can I do the same thing AFK with Thank you. So, how, so yeah, so yeah, how can I do the same thing? Uh, and yeah, essentially what I did is I took the tracks apart, made covers of my own, well, and I picked them apart to make my own covers. And this was, well, you know, Partly because I really like this song, and I just sort of wanted to put my own spin to it. And also, because I want to, you know, to study and teach myself music theory and sound design, because, you know, I figured the best way to learn is to do, right? So, I figured that if I look at how, you know, if I, like, transcribe it, and I look at how the song is arranged, that would, you know, teach me, like, you know, it actually did teach me a lot about music theory and, like, how, you know, songs are arranged, you know, like how, how, you know, chord progressions go along, how, like, you know, different little arpe- different little, like, arpeggios, how, like, melodies and counter melodies interact with each other in order to tell a specific story. And it also taught me, like, you know, a little bit of sound design as well, just because, you know, well, Silken's instrumentation is impressive in and of itself, you know, putting the themes and metaphors aside. So I'm just like, so, and how exactly did I go about with sound design? Um, so a brief word about my process is that... What if? I always start with this little question. I always start with, what if? You know? What if there was a change in instrumentation? What if I enhanced certain parts? What if it was different, but, you know, it stayed the same? Because that was the primary goal here. The primary goal is to keep the story intact, you know? keep the same feeling that Soken was, try to, was trying to convey to us. And I tried to, you know, convey that same sort of feeling, but sort of in my own style, you know? Because 
I figured that'd be the best way to teach myself how to, you know, evoke emotion in my own music, so to speak. And it's very ch it was very challenging, because, of course, Soken is a professional who has decades of experience. I have maybe, what, two years and five or six cover songs of experience, so it was very, very challenging. But it did teach, teach me a lot about Soken's process. Teach, taught me a lot about, you know, what story he was trying to tell, what emotions he was trying to evoke, and how I could essentially achieve the same effect. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, basically, like, I always try to, like, you know, put my own sort of, like, spin to it. Like, if I think that, like, you know, a song enhances, like, you know, I try to, like, like, I listen to, like, a, a song that I want to do, like, I won't listen to, like, 20, 50, 100 times until I get absolutely sick of it. Until I just can't bear listening to it for, like, another single second. And then I start working on it. Because, like, that way, I try my best to, like, you know, sort of take in every little detail, put in, you know, replicate sort of every little detail that I could. Because, again, as I pointed out earlier, it's those little background elements, all those little details that serve to form a cohesive whole in the song. And yeah, basically like, my main pro- yeah, but yeah, that's basically like my entire process. It's just like, how do I tell the same story that Soken tells, but in my own style, with, you know, a change in instrumentation, maybe, maybe enhancing certain- maybe like emphasizing certain parts, certain aspects? And yeah, basically, yeah. So, a couple of closing statements. Uh, I think, personally, I think that, you know, if, uh, if I can become a musician with no experience whatsoever, no background education whatsoever, personally, I think anybody can become a musician. Because I think the, the, the two most important, the two, like, things that, the only two things that you need, I think, are you know, the ability to tap out a rhythm, of course, and inspiration. Because no matter what series it is, no matter whether it's Final Fantasy XIV or another series very beloved to you, if, you know, it makes you resonate, if, if well, not, you know, Portraits of West Bad, if the music resonates with you, you know, if it makes you feel inspired, if it makes you, you know, feel something, if it makes you just, you know, if it just, you know, evokes a lot of emotions in you. And I think, like, that inspiration and, you know, a basic sense of rhythm, really, is all someone needs to become a musician themselves. Uh... Yeah, as I mentioned here, music is one of the purest expressions of a person's self. But, yeah. And it is also very learnable. You don't need natural, well, you know, natural talent, because, like, hey, I didn't know anything. I don't have. I don't know the guy had natural talent. Everything that I know came with hundreds to thousands of hours of practice, hundreds of YouTube videos watched, hundreds of you know experimentations and failures, and just you know going through just you know going through several iterations, seeing what worked, what didn't work, until eventually, hey, you end up with something good. So, uh, yeah, that's about uh pretty much all that I had to say for my panel. I am very glad that you all, uh, I'm very glad that you all stuck around to listen. I'm very glad that you all, you know, very interested in what I wanted to say. And I am also very glad that, you know, I got to like, you know, share, you know, one of my joys and one of my passions with everybody, with everybody else. Just because, well, this is, Something that's very, you know, very, very important to me, very inspirational to me. Um, did you watch the other music panels? Did you watch the other music panel yesterday? Yeah, unfortunately, I did not want to watch it. I really did want to watch it, but I was very, very busy. But I was very busy yesterday, and I had pretty much no time to do anything. Because I had to, you know, prepare this panel, and I had to, you know, make sure everything ran smoothly. But I will check it out later, and I will see what... They have to say about academia uh, and dire. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you all. Thank you all, you know, for listening, for sticking around. I'm glad that, you know, if I taught even one person, like at least something, then, you know, 
I'm glad. I think my I think I did my job. I think you know. I'm just I, I'm just very glad to be here. Thank you all so much for coming. I really, 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 really appreciate it. Now, uh, I will take maybe two or three more minutes just to see if anybody has any questions, and then that will be it for the stream. Honestly, man, the closer I listened to Tiny Tania, honestly, it was like, well, now I know like why this song drives me crazy. So why this song drives me so crazy all the all the damn time? It's like all those key changes, all those like little elements, and it's just like, oh my god, <laughs> you just have to get get your way, man. Yeah, I saw it. Don't think I didn't see it. Are there any other songs in any other parts of the game that you would like to analyze more? Well, excluding Shadowbringers, of course. Um, personally, I think that I think that I, I also think that there's a lot to be said about like you know, sort of uh, other um, other songs like like Stormblood, the four lord like the four lords like that entire arc. I think there is a lot to be said there, but you know, I sort of had to keep this panel to Shadowbringers because you know. I just didn't have the time to talk about Stormblood as well, and also because you know it's a Shadowbringers convention, so you know it makes sense to sort of stick to Shadowbringers. What is one of your favorite songs that you didn't mention? Uh, <laughs> I think I honestly think Emerald Weapon is one of my favorite songs. Like that entire theme, like wow, that is just I could I could do like an entire essay on that itself, but you know I think I think we can perhaps leave that for a for another time. Maybe another video, maybe another day. We will see. Your thoughts on the new music within the Final Fantasy universe? Uh, eh, I think it's more or less its own thing. Uh, I think the only thing that like Nier has, like I think like, the only connection Nier has to uh, Final Fantasy really is uh, just Prelude. <laughs> That's about it. Am I ready for Endwalker? Oh, you bet. Can't wait. Where can we hear? Ah, uh, where can you hear my music? All right, uh, all right. Yes, yeah, it's time for it's time for a little promo. Hold on. All right, so. For anyone who is watching this stream, here is my channel where I post just about everything. And actually, I will. I'm I, I, I'm just, I'm just gonna like show you around real quick. I'm not gonna play anything. I'm just gonna show you around. Yeah. I already have a few. I already have a few covers here, as you see. I've done to the edge because a long time ago, you may or may not know me for this one, which personally I think is. <laughs> one of my more amateurish works at this point. Like, at this point, I didn't really know a whole lot about sound design or sort of instrumentation. Yeah, I've done Eden Leviathan, I've done Sunrise, I've done em Emerald Weapon, and I've done Ruby Weapon. And, uh, fun fact, I also, well, this is just between, this is just between you and me, don't tell anybody else. <laughs> but I do have a small project in the works that should be out Maybe within the week? Maybe? And the only thing that I have to say about that is... Do you know Lahi? So, look forward to that. Keep an eye out. And we will see how it turns out. That's up, Well, uh, well... We'll have to see how that turns out. I'm not gonna spoil anything. It's a surprise. Alright, just a couple more questions. And that'll be it. Yeah, let's see. Do I like Dragon Song? Yeah, 
It's a very good song. It tells, like, you know, like the Shadowbring, I think like like all of the main themes in the game, it also tells a very nice story. Dragon Song is, is a very, very good song. It has a lot to tell. I like, I, I like it a lot overall. Very, very good. And do I have thoughts about Answers? Well, okay, I'll admit, Answers is also very much primarily a storytelling tool. But I will admit, it's been a it's been a very very long time. I haven't really listened to it a whole lot, so I will have to listen to it a few more times just just to um, just you know sort of get an idea, get a feel for it and what it's like. All right. Well, I think I've ran I think I've ran off for far too long. Once again, thank you, thank you all so much for attending. I really appreciate you all you know just sort of being here. I will see you all uh, whenever. See you all sometime later, and please do keep an eye out on my do keep an eye out for more covers because that will be coming very very soon, sooner than you may expect. Who knows? All right. Okay, good good turnout. Thank you all. I'll see you all later. Bye bye. Have a good one, enjoy the rest of the con, and see you all in Endwalker.